if you get used to that, I've only got th really three really difficult moments in those two bars instead of, which is what we see it and we think, oh my God, how am I gonna play all these notes fast enough, accurately enough, loud enough, with enough emotion? But the real difficulty is comes where the hand has to change position and has to change balance. I hope that makes sense because I hope that will make it not easy, but easier. Charles Rosen in his book on uh, the Romantic era talks about the fact that Chopin, particularly, many composers do this, but when the music reaches its greatest peak of emotional intensity and perhaps conflict and anguish and emotional difficulty, very often that's when the technical difficulties accentuate too. So it's almost as a bit as if he's a sadist. In other words, you've had this hard piece and now I'm gonna really ratchet up the tensions. And in addition to the emotional musical tensions, I'm gonna make it a lot harder for you to play it. Now, I don't think that's what went through his mind, but there is that feeling we can, we can hate him uh, sometimes for doing this. And there's, there's a joke in probably every conservatory in the world that if you, for your final exam, come and you have one of the four Chopin ballades offered, the, the faculty usually will hear about three minutes of the beginning and then say, thank you, dear, please skip to the coda. And so you better be prepared for that because they sort of all do it because they're, they're, they're testing you. They're testing you, putting you through your paces to see if you can, if you've really mastered the coda and if you can play it kind of on short notice um, because the codas are very difficult. These codas, these tales are the climaxes of all these four great pieces. And they're in the case of the G minor, F minor and F major ballads, they're ferociously intense as well. Um, so the lead up to the coda is very similar to the lead up to the second big effulgent tune in A major. It, it crescendos the same way, so I would advise you not to get too wild and too fast, but really hold that tension back and then let it go at the Appassionata in 206. In other words, don't get too carried away with Because really what you need to save the excitement for is this introduction to the coda. So anyway, I would advise just what, grade your crescendos once again. So you can have an outburst. There's enough tension in this harmony. You don't need to push it with much extra sound or much extra movement. It'll, it'll, it'll carry you. Um, but make sure you save it for that outburst burst, and then the coda. Now, the coda. This is really hard. Um, per, the opening of the coda from bar 208 is not so bad. The, yeah, it's not easy, but um, these repeated figures are not so bad. And may, even though there's an accent on the second one, very often if you, if you just aim for the first one, it's a trick that on the piano, if you have ba-bum, you don't have to go uh uh ba bum. You don't have to go. You'll get stuck. You have to go. It's kind of a rebound. We could talk about that in the Schumann concerto. It's not. It for bum. Anyway, that's a subject for another time. Um, but this is not so bad. The left hand is difficult because it's jumpy and the and the bass is off the beat. But that's nothing compared to what happens at bar two sixteen, where you have this anguished music. <laughs> Except with all these wiggles fi uh, figuring it in where you have a single note in the thumb and a, a double stop or a double note in the upper hand, in the upper part of the hand. So the left hand there is, thank goodness, not so bad. Now, how to practice this? The beginning is easy. That's, no, that's not really much difficulty. Since you have the benefit of the pedal, get off of the second A flat in the thumb. Get your hand off of that immediately. Don't get stuck there and have to jump down there. Move yourself. The greatest difficulty comes when you have to go from a spread out position with the middle note toward the top of the hand to one like that because that alters the whole balance of the whole hand. So this is the worst for me here. 
Um, but similarly, once you've, once you've played the second eighth note, which is not so hard, that's not so hard to play for most people, even with smaller hands, don't get stuck holding that down. You have to move off of things immediately. You have the benefit of the pedal there from you, but even if you didn't, you need strong attacks. Not You need to not hang on with any extra tension in your hand. So practice it really slow movement, motion three ways. Practice it as an octave, which is obvious, or learn how to do that, but make sure that after each note you relax your hand, especially the, the double note. And as a matter of fact, you can jump off of that double note and launch yourself to the next to the next thing. Just as I said about um, some uh, jump in the scherzo, it's not uh uh, it's a it's a rebound motion. So if you get too stuck there with your hand, you're gonna have trouble getting your thumb up to the F sharp. Uh, and consequently, at the end of the bar, make sure you're down there ahead. So if I slow, show it to you in slow motion, and slow motion is good to practice. Actually, I'm going to stop where, at each difficult moment. I know it probably looks easier when I'm doing it, but if you get used to that, I've only got th really three really difficult moments in those two bars, instead of, which is what we see it and we think, oh my God, how am I gonna play all these notes fast enough, accurately enough, loud enough, with enough emotion? But the real difficulty is comes where the hand has to change position and has to change balance. I hope that makes sense because I hope that will make it not easy, but easier, because it's it's a really difficult um, passage, and it really it it challenges the hand a great deal, and it challenges your emotions and your whole musical sensibility because you've had this whole ten minute you've been playing for ten minutes, and you're really in a state of frenzied excitement by then. It also gets very much more difficult toward the end of it, when you have to build a crescendo in bars two thirty through uh, two thirty eight. 238 is kind of easy because you don't have any jumping and you can use your hands. And that's all spectacular and, you know, not so hard to play and it sounds great. But, um, so, you know, the old list adage is the moment you see crescendo cut back. In other words, well, you don't want to do it so much that it, 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 it sounds uh, obvious, but you don't need to play this whole coda fortissimo either. Um, when, I, when I say that, it should be pretty loud and pretty brilliant, but you don't need to play at the maximum of your physical force, which will just wear you down, and also leave you nothing for bars 230 to 238, which, are, which have the problem, in addition, of going higher where the sound is thinner. So what you need when the sound is thinner is not weight, but you need... You really need strong attacks. And once again, I keep calling it this relaxation response. There's nothing relaxed about it, but still, I'm actually not holding down. From millisecond to millisecond, I'm actually getting off the notes. Um, even, even if you leave your fingers lazily, I can, but I'm not all stiff with my hand. And it's that stiffness that wears you out. Chopin always talked about suppleness. Also, don't go for speed and power at, at first. Make sure you know where you are. Make sure you know which notes of the left hand are which, with which ones of the right hand. Uh, the because we do have two sides of our brain and each one is dealing with a different hand. Uh, and locating ourselves in space and time. So make sure you know which notes are going where. It's mostly pretty pretty simple, but still, especially when you have to stop jumping with octaves. That's not so bad, one note in the bass, but once, once again, once you have to start doing those terms. The moment I play the upper chord, I let the hand fold back to there, so I'm already on the road to the next chord. 
because I see too much people stay, stay here and then it's a jump. Oh my God. So you, it's like walking along, you, you go from one to the next. For jumps like that in the bass, um, once again, don't think of it as being down here and then up here and having to move all the way back down. Sort of hover a little bit in the middle. So, you, you know, like the robotic arm, you're more or less there. It takes some of the fear of the distance away. Um, what can I say? It's, it's very hard anyway. After that, you have a, one of Chopin's greatest theatrical coups. This important material in the left hand, you've got a difficult chromatic scale on the right hand, but you have this board. Which you remember from these build up. And very important, do not ignore one, Sometimes people forget about that F sharp or try to get in. The F sharp's more important than all of that stuff in the right hand. The right hand is very important, but you do. Because that really, that gives the piece its, its final climax. So while the right hand is very important, the left hand is really critical. then it swoops up. Um, I mean, it, it only takes, what, you know, months to practice all of that stuff, and I don't mean to be just sort of fast-forwarding through this, but the left hand really has to drive, but we become so preoccupied. Which is important, terribly important, but you, this has to... Con it's sort of like bringing the, all, all the birds coming home to roost. This is really the, the sort of the stake in the heart of the uh, vampire, as you will. Hello, I'm pianist Garrick Olson, and I'd like to talk to you about the first ballade of Chopin, Opus 23, the ballade in G minor. I guess I have to begin at my...